Well, as we've been saying all morning, it's the beginning of a new year, and if you're like me, you have reflected on how the year has gone in the past, and you've thought about how you want this new year to be different. Maybe even thinking about, you know, how you want to make your life better in 2017. And so we do. We make New Year's resolutions, and we set goals, and we make plans for how we're going to accomplish what it is what we want to do. Well, today I start a four-week message series that I'm calling Reset, Getting Unstuck in the New Year. And over the next four weeks, if you stick with me, you are going to have an opportunity to set some goals in your life that will not only help you to live successfully in 2017, but these goals will honor God as you prayerfully set them in light of what God wants to accomplish in and through you. We're going to look at four key areas of life that need to be set in the right direction as this new year begins. And maybe you're like me. You, you've felt stuck in your life right now. Uh, we're going to talk about how you can reset whatever it is in your life that's not functioning optimally. Now, to reset something, it is to restore it to its original design, right? To restore it to its original purpose, its original intent. It is literally to set again or to reorganize so that something can do what it was intended to do to begin with. So when your smartphone is sluggish and it just can't seem to muster the energy to do whatever it is you want it to do, what do you have to do? You have to shut down all the apps. You have to shut down its power and reboot it, right? It needs to be reset. Last week when I was at a family Christmas gathering, I was taking pictures with my phone and it just froze up. It wouldn't do anything. Of course, I got a little nervous about that. Then a message pops up on the screen and it says something to the effect, your camera is confused. Please shut down your phone. <laughs> I shut the phone down. I restarted it. Guess what? Everything went right again. It was fine with the world. I didn't even know a smartphone could get confused, but apparently they can. Sometimes things in our everyday living need to be reset, don't they? When your marriage spirals downwards because of constant misunderstandings, it needs an infusion of communication. It needs you know, more quality time. It needs to be reset. Or when the team you're on at work, it fails to hit its numbers. Maybe, you know, excellence has slipped or customer issues have gone unresolved or agreed upon goals haven't been met. It needs to have its accountability shored up. It needs more creativity. It needs to be reset. Or how about when you return to normality after the holidays and you discover that you're five pounds heavier than you were before December began? Your health regimen, it needs a little structure, right? It needs some boundaries for change. It needs something green for heaven's sake. It needs to be reset, your health regimen. And you know, it's not just you. It's all of us. We all have these resets that we need to do. And so that's why we're going to spend this entire month of January working through four key resets that can re-energize the core of who we are. The resets that we're going to look at will involve four areas of your life. Your mind, your words, your work, and today we're looking at your heart. How do we reset our hearts? If you want the kind of reset that lasts, though, you need to start with resetting your heart. What do you put your faith into? What do you really trust in? If I was to come up to you and ask you about what you believe in, what you put your faith into, you'd probably come up with a number of answers. But the question is, do you really believe what you say? A man by the name of Ken Davis was assigned to a project that he then had to do a presentation on for his college science class. And the title of his presentation was The Law of the Pendulum. You know, those big things that swing back and forth, like maybe on a clock or whatever. But in a nutshell... The law of the pendulum, and he spent about 20 minutes explaining all the scientific principles behind this thing, and the, the law of the pendulum states that a pendulum can never return to a point higher th than the point from which it was released, because of gravity and because of 
friction, when the pendulum returns, it will always fall short of its original release point, making less and less of an arc until finally it comes to total rest. And his professor and his class, they understood what he was saying. They accepted that as true and accurate. But Davis's presentation didn't stop there. He wanted to test his class's faith in the law of the swinging pendulum. And so he pointed to the large pendulum that was in the middle of their science classroom. It was hanging from the metal rafters. And he pointed out that it was 250 pounds of weights that were tied to four strands of 500-pound test parachute cord. And he then asked his professor to climb on a table that he had, had set up against the wall with a chair on it. And he asked his professor to sit in that chair and put his head against that cement wall. And then he brought that pendulum to just within a, 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 an inch of his nose, his professor's nose. And holding the, the pendulum just an inch away from his face, he once again explained the law of the pendulum that everyone said they had faith in just moments earlier. He said, if the law of the pendulum is true, when I release this mass of metal, it will swing across the room and return back short of its release point, right? Your nose, he says, will be in no danger. <laughs> so the professor's now getting a little bit nervous because he's beginning to sense where this presentation is going. So here he is sitting in the chair with his head against the wall, the 250-pound pendulum is released. It swooshes across the room, pauses, and then starts to come back. And you can probably guess what the professor did. He dove out of his chair onto the floor. He was not even going to take any chances whatsoever when he saw all those weights coming at him. Hmm. It is in moments like these when we discover what we really put our faith in, isn't it? When we really discover what we believe. Does your faith need a reset this January 1st, 2017? Does it seem like your faith is sluggish and it just isn't where it ought to be? And if so, you're not any different from the Israelites who lived back in the day of King David. In fact, open up your Bibles with me. Turn to Psalm 24. I want to read Psalm 24 in its entirety. You can follow along with me or just listen Psalm 24, it's kind of in the middle of the Bible. Psalms are the biggest book in the Bible. Psalm 24, beginning with verse 1, this is what it says. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and he established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. <clears throat> Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. Amen? Amen. David wrote this psalm, and it was first sung as he and the Israelites brought the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem to be placed in a, into an elaborate tent called the Tabernacle. And we read of this in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 12 through 15, where it says, So David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. The city of David was Jerusalem. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all of his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sounds of trumpets. The temple in which the ark would later be housed hadn't been built yet. And David's faith was renewed as he and the Israelites danced with singing and music in a processional as that ark was brought into the city of Jerusalem. So the question might be forming in your mind, why is this such a big deal for David and the Israelites? And what is this ark of the covenant? Well, the ark of the covenant had been built 400 years prior to this point, to prior to these events, and it was built by Moses at God's request. 
In Exodus chapter 31, God directed Moses to build the ark that would house the divinely inscribed Ten Commandments along with some other holy artifacts. Now an ark is just a fancy word for a box, right? A box. In this case, it was a box made of acacia wood and gold. But because this is the ark of God's covenant, this was far more than just a box. The ark of the covenant represented God's solemn pledge to his people. And if they would obey him and keep his laws, he would bless them and they would prosper all of their days. But the inverse was also true. If they refused to obey God, Instead of choosing to run their lives their own way and excluding God and his law, they would be subject to the consequences that unfold whenever we remove ourselves from God's protection and provision. Like so many of us sitting here today, the Israelites had to learn that lesson the hard way. Because you see, the singing of Psalm 24, as they process through the gates of Jerusalem with the Ark of the Covenant, it represents a reset, so to speak, of David's and the Israelites' faith because they had not always been so faithful. Twenty years earlier, the Israelites contended with a people known as the Philistines. The Philistines were the bitter rival of the Israelites from the earliest days. If the Israelites were the University of Michigan, the Philistines were Ohio State. <laughs> if, the, if Israel was... St. John's, the Philistines, would be DeWitt. If Israel were the Lions, the Philistines would be the Bears or the Packers, you know? You, you get the picture. These are, are two groups. They hated each other. They were committed to each other's full destruction. And they would face off for seven major times, seven major battles that we read about in the Bible, the most famous of which involved David and who? Goliath, Goliath the giant Goliath, that's correct. So 20 years before, David brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem to set it up there. The faith of David and the Israelites wasn't so strong. In fact, we read in 1 Samuel chapter 4 of the battle between the Israelites and the Philistines in which more than 4,000 Israelites lost their lives. And the sad, disillusioned Israelites, they gathered together to try and figure out what to do. All their, all their leaders. Their troops were decimated by the Philistines. They couldn't stand for this. And so they get this brilliant idea. The, they, this idea starts to sweep through the, the heads of the ranks. And they say, hey, you know what? We have the Ark of the Covenant. It represents our holy God. It represents his power, his success, his sufficiency, his victory, his superior, superiority over all things, including the Philistines. Why don't we just trot out the Ark of the Covenant and show these Philistines who's really boss? And in that moment, the Ark of the Covenant represented to the Israelites something like a genie in a bottle, right? It, it kind of was like a magic box to them that would indulge their every selfish whim. And even though their hearts weren't really with God, they hadn't really committed themselves to him they still didn't like being embarrassed and they were afraid. So they half-heartedly thought to themselves, let's give God another chance. But God is no genie in a bottle. He will not be mocked. In their heart of hearts, the Israelites were still rebelling against God and now they expected him to show up on their behalf. Can I just say something here? God's not a genie in a bottle. You can't just take them out whenever you're in trouble and, and, and then just kind of put them back in when you're finished with them. The Israelites, they bring out the ark. They re-engage the Philistines in battle, but this time 30,000 Israelites are killed in battle. What's more, the Philistines now nab the ark for themselves and they take it back to their territory. But they soon found out, however, that the supernatural power and the authority of the God of Israel was real. Because they set the ark up next to their pagan god, their false god, Dagon. And it was supernaturally destroyed while in the presence of the ark. Moreover, sores break out on the bodies of the Philistines and all their towns. And after, they're, after that, they're overrun by rats. And they start to realize there's a connection here. And so the Philistines, they give the ark back to the Israelites, right? 
We read that in 1 Samuel 6. And for the next 20 years, the ark is just kind of stored in the house of one of the Israelites in a town called Kiriath Urim. And it's kind of forgotten about. Now, fast forward 20 years. David is returning the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem to the special place that he had prepared for it. As he brings it back to its rightful place, he's singing a song, Psalm 24, that we just read. He's singing it to God, and he's talking about God's goodness and God's power throughout the earth. He's talking about the importance of having pure hearts and clean hands before the Lord and the foolishness of trusting in false idols and false gods. I just want to say to you this morning, what was true for the Israelites is true for us today. God created them in his own image. He purposed them to love him. He set them apart to bring him glory. And he equipped them for serving people and making a difference in this world. And all they had to do was let God be God in their lives. And it's the same for you and me. Resetting your faith means saying to God, yes, you can be God. You can chart my course. You can pave my path. And I'm trusting you to meet my needs. That's what resetting your faith means. Interestingly, though, just like the Israelites, it's not that we outright say no to God, as though we say, no, God, you're not going to be my God. I'm not going to believe in you. We don't outright say to God, no, I don't need you. I don't, I don't want your help today. It's just that often we give God our maybe rather than our yes, and we forget about him. We leave him sitting in a box somewhere. Our Lord says, will you let me be God in your life? And our response is, maybe, if it's convenient, if I need you. <laughs> How about in 2017, we stop saying maybe to God, and we say, yes, I'm all in. What would that look like for us? Based on Psalm 24, I can tell you what it looked like for David. He reset his heart of faith by doing three things. First, David stood in God's holy place. We see that in verse 3. He pursued God's presence. And those who with reset hearts pursue God's presence too. This is what it means to ascend the mountain of the Lord. We come into the presence of God. It takes intentionality to do that, my friends. You don't have to spend your days standing in a desperate place or standing in a depressed place or a fearful place or a sinful place. You can plant yourself in the presence of God by pursuing him instead of all the other distracting habits and addictions that we chase after. We like to stand in stores shopping. We like to spend our time on inappropriate and totally immoral websites. We like to stand in social media sites like Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat. We like to stand in the presence of popular people and the presence of movers and shakers. I remember one time I was meeting with a group of community leaders down at Main Street Cafe downtown and after the meeting concluded, I was walking out of the restaurant and a guy comes up to me and he says, wow, you must be really important hanging out with all those big wigs. I kind of liked that a little bit. <laughs> we like to be in the presence of big wigs, don't we? Or celebrities or sports stars. But where are all these other people when you're struggling with life's purpose and meaning? Where are they when you're struggling with dissatisfaction in your life? Or you're looking for something more to this life. You see, we can stand in, in God's holy place by recognizing his presence and by recognizing his power and his love. Maybe it starts out by being in church, but it certainly isn't the only space where we encounter God's presence. Look for his power and grace wherever you do, wherever you are, and whatever you may be thinking. A second thing David did to reset his heart of faith is he rejected impurity. And those with reset hearts reject impurity also. When we draw near to God, when we ascend the mountain of the Lord, as Psalm 24 verses 3 and 4 says, we are named among those who have clean hands and pure hearts. Jesus once said, Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You know, when something is pure, it's the real deal. It's whole, it's complete, it's devoid of other substances that distract from its genuineness. It's not filled with fluff, okay? When a person is pure or he or she is free from anything that is morally inappropriate, that's what pure means. Free from sin, free from guilt, which comes from doing what is wrong. And you and I, we cannot see God 
or be in his presence if our life is characterized by impurity. And so we come to Jesus and he comes to us. He imparts his thoughts, his ways, his responses, his desires to us, and we begin to resemble him. And he transforms our life. Is there immorality in your life that needs to be addressed, that needs to be rejected? Here's a third thing that a reset heart does. David trusted in God alone. And those with reset hearts, they also put their trust in God alone. Look at verse 4 of Psalm 24, the end of the verse. Those who ascend the mountain of the Lord, who love God, who respond with a wholehearted, yes, I'm all in, when Jesus offers to reset their faith, they do not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They are those who put their faith and trust in Jesus alone. Listen, the thing other than God that you've been putting your faith in is going to fail you someday. At some point in time, that person, that thing is going to fall, just like the Philistine false god of Dagon fell at the feet of Jesus, and it's going to beg for mercy. And we think that idols are a thing of the past, but they're not. There are all sorts of people and things that we tend to put in front of God, that we tend to devote ourselves to. It might be your spouse. It might be a church leader. It might be your parents or your children that you put your trust in, but they let you down someday. It might be your job or your money that you put your trust in, but someday it's all gone. Maybe you put your faith and your trust in how many likes you get on Facebook, or you put your faith in your health. Whatever it is that you're putting your faith into today, someday it will let you down and it will be gone altogether. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that those things aren't important. I'm just saying that Jesus is the only one worthy of your faith. And if you're looking to reset your heart of faith this year so that you are pursuing the right things, so that you have the right priorities, make sure that your ultimate faith and trust is in Jesus. What are some of the things that you're putting your trust in, that you're putting your faith in these days? Is it time to turn back to God? Don't wait to find yourself in a pickle, needing some serious strength from on high. You know, there are a lot of people, and maybe you're one of them, who only come to God when they're feeling desperate, when they feel like they need his help. I can't pay this bill. My girlfriend's pregnant. Uh, my husband's threatening to leave me. My teenager flunked again. The, the company is doing more layoffs. You know, the test results were positive. The, the court hearing is coming up. When we do this kind of thing and then we appeal to God, we're no different than the Israelites who call out the Philistines. They just slaughtered our best guys and then they drag out the Ark of the Covenant, right? Thinking that God should do something for them now. Friends, God is inviting us into something more than just a maybe kind of faith this year. Jesus offers you a heart reset, a reset from maybe faith to faith that is full on and all in. He says, listen, this is how it works. You draw near to me, I will draw near to you. And if you're weary of running away from God, if you're tired of going it alone in life, if you sense that there is something more for you than what you've experienced thus far, if you're looking for a mission that matters, if you're sick of the sores and the rats and the darkness of a sin-streaked life, then what you need is a reset. You need a reset. And the good news is your faith can be reset today, right here, right now, before you get in your car to go home. And in this coming week, I also want to encourage you to think about what you need to do on your part so that God can reset in your heart with regard to your faith. And so on your sermon notes, on the back of your sermon notes that are in the bulletins, I've given you a space to write down a goal or two in connection with resetting your, fa your faith. That's what we're looking at today. Over the next three weeks, we'll look at some other areas of life. But what do you desire to see for a reset in your heart? And what are you willing to do to make that happen? That's what this week's all about. Let's pray. Father, we just ask you to reorient us and to remake us and to reinvent us and restore us. Reset us, Lord, here in this moment of surrender. Forgive us for running. Forgive us for sinning. 
Forgive us for keeping you in a box. May we see you with fresh vision, your holiness in this new year, which beckons us to right living and real change. In this new year, we draw near to you, Lord, and we eagerly await your drawing near to us. And so we commit ourselves here and now to following your lead when it comes to our faith so that we can make a difference. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.